Hi everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about septic shock. So let's get into it. So the first thing we want to do is just kind of break down those two words, septic and shock. Shock occurs in the body when there is not enough oxygen being delivered to our organs. It's, there's poor perfusion occurring in the body. Okay? Septic shock is a type of shock that is caused by an infection. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a bacterial infection. So sepsis is the body kind of overreacting to an infection. So an infection that is now systemic. So the whole body is reacting to this infection. So how does this happen? First, you get an infection, right? So the infection then causes damage to our small blood vessels. Those small blood vessels then start to leak fluid into the surrounding tissues. And because they're doing that, because they have this leakage of fluid, then the heart is not going to be able to pump as strong as it normally would. So it decreases the heart's ability to do its job well. And because the heart is not pumping like it's supposed to, you're not getting enough blood flow, therefore you're not getting enough oxygen to your organs and surrounding tissues. Okay, so this is what we mean by low perfusion. So low perfusion is that lack of blood, aka lack of oxygen being distributed throughout the body. So that's how somebody can go into shock from an infection. A mnemonic to help you remember who's at risk for septic shock is sepsis. So the first S is surgery. So somebody who's recently had surgery. We all know that one of the risks of surgical procedures is infection. So that surgery can lead to an infection, which could turn into sepsis, which could turn into septic shock. So recent surgery. E is for extremes in age. So the very young and the very old. We're talking about small babies and the elderly. P is for people who've just had an organ transplant. So when you have an organ transplant, your immunity is suppressed, making you more susceptible to infection. And when we get an infection, that could turn into sepsis, which could turn into septic shock. S is for generalized sickness. These are people with chronic conditions that decrease their immunity and make them more susceptible. Things like diabetes and renal failure. I is for having an indwelling device. So something like a Foley catheter or a central line, a trach, anything like that puts you at risk for getting an infection. And then finally, our last S is for suppressed immune system. So they have illnesses that suppress their immune system. Things like HIV, AIDS, their use of steroids. Maybe they have cancer and they're doing chemotherapy, which suppresses the immune system. So lots of things can put us at risk for getting septic and then that becoming septic shock. So how would you know if your patient is in septic shock? What signs and symptoms might they present with? Well, they're going to have a hard time breathing. They're going to be tachypnic, so they're going to have um, really fast breathing. Their heart rate is also going to be elevated. And let's think about why that is. The heart rate is going faster because the heart's not working as well, and it knows it's not working as well. So it's trying to fix the problem. It's trying to get more blood pumping by making itself go faster. So they're going to have tachycardia and then tachypnea. They're going to have hypotension, remember? So that fluid is being leaked into the surrounding tissues. It's not going where it's supposed to. They're going to have low blood pressure. And because they have that low blood pressure, they're not getting enough um, oxygen and blood to their organs. They might be confused if they're not getting enough oxygen to their brain. They might feel a little dizzy, lightheaded, confused, disoriented. All of those things can happen. Um, they're unable to control their temperature. So sometimes people with sepsis will have very high, high fevers, and sometimes they'll have very, very cold temperatures. So it can be either way. So monitoring their temperature and making sure it's in normal range is going to be a priority for you. Um, and they can have little to no urine output. Because remember, our kidneys are being affected now. Our kidneys are not getting enough perfusion. They're not getting what they need. So they're not going to be working as well. So we're not going to be seeing that output. And then when it comes to testing that we would expect to be done, we're going to do a CBC. One of the big things we're going to look for in that CBC is our white blood cell count, right? Because we know that's going to be elevated because of infection. 
They're going to do ABGs to make sure that they're not um, acidotic. We're going to do a CMP, so a metabolic panel, get our electrolytes, and especially what we want to look at is their lactate levels. So lactate is a chemical that is produced by our body when our body is having stress. So something like an infection, especially a very big infection, is very, very stressful on the body. So somebody who has sepsis is going to have very high levels of lactate. We might want to take samples from their urine, their saliva, or their cere uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, what are we doing with that? That's going to help us maybe hopefully determine the causative bacteria so we can treat it better. Same thing with the chest x-ray. We're looking to see, okay, is this a respiratory infection? Is that the main cause of this? Maybe they had pneumonia and now it's gotten worse. They've gone septic and now they've gone into septic shock because of that pneumonia. The chest x-ray is going to let us see what's going on in the thoracic cavity. Same thing with the CT or the MRI. So we're doing scans to check the function of our organs and to see how they're being affected by this. One way you can remember all the treatments and nursing interventions for septic shock is the mnemonic, septic shock. So the first S is for start antibiotics. Because we know the majority of the time this is going to be a bacterial infection, antibiotics are going to be our number one medication for treatment of sepsis. You're going to start with broad spectrum antibiotics, and then once we identify the causative organism, we're going to specialize and pick whatever is needed for that one. You don't need to wait until you know exactly what the causative organism is. It's very important that they start broad spectrum antibiotics right away. So first, we're going to do that. The next thing we might want to do is give enteral nutrition. Um, the body is going through a lot right now. It's under a lot of stress. So giving enteral nutrition can kind of decrease the stress that the GI system is under at the moment. Some medications we might want to give. We might want to start them on PPIs, again, for that stress. We don't want them to get like a gastric ulcer or a bleed as a result of being in septic shock. So something like a PPI can help reduce the risk of that. Pressors, vasopressive medications. Remember, they are hypotensive, so their blood pressure is too low. One of the things we need to do is increase that blood pressure. So these medications, they cause vasoconstriction, which will help increase the blood pressure. Treatment is going to be in the ICU. These patients are very, very ill, so very unstable. They need to be in an intensive care setting. I, we have a couple of them for I. So we're going to insert Foley because we're going to be on strict INO. We want to make sure that they are making urine, or if they're not making urine, um, we need to be aware of that. Ionotropic medications, again, Partly why they're going to be in the ICU is because some of these medications are a lot more intense and a lot more severe. So these medications help your heart beat stronger. So we know part of the issue with the perfusion or the lack of perfusion in shock is the heart's not really pumping. It's not really beating like it's supposed to. It's not doing its job very well. So these medications are meant to help with that. And then they might need insulin. Sometimes they can have these really high blood sugars that are going to need to be controlled. So they might even need to be on an insulin drip. C is for checking those blood sugars, so that glucose. Our goal in septic shock is to get that blood sugar less than 180. And then, of course, checking vitals frequently. And in the second part, the shock part, <laughs> um, we might need to give steroids in some cases. That can help. Um, sedation. So some of these patients are going to be very acutely ill. They're going to need, jumping down to O, oxygen, and they might need to be on mechanical ventilation. Well, in order for that to happen, you need to be sedated. H is for hemodynamic monitoring. Of course, we're going to be keeping up on all of our labs. C is for those cultures, those blood cultures, so we can identify the exact thing that's causing it so we can treat it better. And they're definitely going to need a central line. And then finally, our last letter here is K, keep IV fluids going. When you're in shock, you have that low blood pressure. One way we can help bring your blood pressure up is by giving you lots of IV fluids. So this is our little mnemonic to learn septic shock nursing interventions. Septic shock needs to be taken very seriously. These patients are very, very ill. 
Complications can include organ failure. Every organ in your body can fail, okay? So you can have kidney failure, liver failure, um, heart failure. Everything can go wrong and you can even die. This is a very serious illness. Um, but hopefully, if we know a little bit more about it, we can catch it or even prevent it. And we'll know how to take care of our patients if this ever happens. That was my video on septic shock. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.